the Gracie family. 30 years of training got beat in 10 seconds by a jiu-jitsu person. So that, that's what got me into jiu-jitsu. The pleasure of the food, the taste of the food, becomes a determining factor why we eat certain things and we don't eat other things. Didn't your dad at 95 still he could do jiu-jitsu and handstands or something? I saw a video one time. What, wasn't he like that? He was 94 and a half, six mm. months before he passed away. And kicked my butt at 94 and a half. You were telling me you went down to Central America and they tested your biological age. What did you say that the number was? Welcome everybody to the Ty Lopez Show. I am here with a very special guest, Grandmaster Horion Gracie. If you've ever heard of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you probably know and have heard of the family, the Gracie family. Um, Grandmaster Horion is one of the, you could say, the, the godfathers of the family. I think I read that in the Guinness Book of World Records, it's the largest professional sports family. It has the most children, cousins, sisters, brothers that are professional athletes. So it's pretty quite an accomplishment. Um, yeah, the Gracies are like a plague, man, all over the place now. <laughs> <laughs> like a plague, okay. Um, yeah, well... I've I've uh, trained with your sons and and um, of course uh, you know you're above you that you learn from your father and uncle right that were kind of the founders of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu right that's right so in fact so those thanks. are the ones that reserved the, the tenth degree of red belt is for the guys who found it my father oh. and his brothers everybody okay. else can only get to ninth degree so so good. your father was Elio Helio and he he is the 10th degree and his brother carlos right was the what year did they found the 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 the, the sport because they were doing like japanese style jujitsu which wasn't that good if you were a smaller guy so what what year was it when they actually launched yeah in around 1915 1917 mitsui maeda wow it came to brazil as an aid okay. to a japanese immigration colony he befriended my grandfather gaston and then my, uh -huh. my grandfather helped him get settled in northern Brazil. And then to show gratitude to my grandfather, uh, Mitsui Maeda offered to teach Jiu-Jitsu to my then 15-year-old uncle Carlos, who was the oldest of eight children, five of okay. them were boys. My dad was the youngest one, 11 years younger than my uncle Carlos. And uh, so uncle Carlos trained with a Japanese instructor for a couple of years. And then when the family moved from northern Brazil, where they live in the state of Pará by the Amazon, when they moved down south to Rio, Uncle Carlos shared the techniques he learned, the Japanese version of Jiu-Jitsu, with his brothers. And then um, my father at the time was physically a frail child. He ran up a flight of stairs and had thinking spells and stuff like that. So the doctors <clears throat> at the time recommended he be kept away from any kind of physical activity, which included Jiu-Jitsu. So as the <clears throat> brothers kept learning from Uncle Carlos and fine-tuning their techniques, my father used to just hang out and, and watch the brothers train. Until one day, when he was 16 years old, a student show up for a class, but my uncles are not around to teach the class. So my father, based on what he had memorized over the years, <clears throat> offered to teach the men a class. The guy agreed. My father stepped on the mat and taught the men a class. By the time they got done, Uncle Carlos showed up, very apologetic. I'm so sorry I'm late. Let's have the class now. And the student said, Carlos, I had a class with a little brother, Elio, and I liked it. In fact, I want to be his student from now on. So my <laughs> father was promoted to be a teacher by his own student. What the old man realized is the technique he had memorized based on the traditional jiu-jitsu the brothers were practicing required a certain amount of physical ability and strength and speed, which he did not have. So to trial and error, my father started modifying the traditional Japanese techniques, giving more emphasis to natural body movements, better timing, shorter techniques, more leverage, and so forth, making it possible so that he could become proficient in spite of his you know, lack of strength. Transformation process is what we give name we call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, it's so interesting because so many guys, they, I actually saw in the 1950s, there was one of the most famous marketing pieces of advertisement. It was in like comic books and it showed like 10 little squares. And the first square was a guy with his girlfriend. And then a bully came and kicked sand on him. 
and he was too weak so he couldn't you know fight back and the girl said oh you're weak and she didn't like him and the girl went with the bully and the boy and you in in the movie um karate kid was the same thing you know they have the main character ralph macho is at the beach and then he gets beat up by this guy and then he learns how to train but the right. the that was teaching uh an old program of like um where you push your hands together isometrics but brazilian jiu-jitsu the thing about it it's so effective it like so many things that they say mm -hmm. a skinny weaker guy or even a strong guy can do they just don't work in reality whereas jujitsu is like i like jujitsu you know i'm only a blue belt i'm not even remotely near where you are obviously um but even as a blue belt you just it's it works you can hold something you can go for the neck if in a night what people don't realize it's like a dog most dangerous and vulnerable part of a human. A dog goes for your neck if it wants to kill you. And jujitsu, instead of trying to do eye pokes and this, that, it's like, am I right to say that the majority of fights, like very serious street fights, end up with a rear naked choke? Well, some, often it's a very common move because if you get into a fight with someone and if most of the fights will end up in a clinch and eventually get to the ground, if the person has an idea of what they're doing, they're going to look for a top position. And on the process of, you know, scaring or punching or striking the opponent, it's very common that in order to protect themselves from getting hurt, they'll turn their back, exposing themselves for a rear naked show. It's kind of a natural evolution of things. Yes, it's a very common move and very handy. And instead of beating somebody to a pulp, you can just put them out to sleep. And it's a very much a more humane way to control the situation. <laughs> yeah, because you could just kind of that neck is that weak point. Obviously, there's other moves. Um, right. Yeah. Not, so I'm so thankful you came on. We're going to talk about the Gracie diet, which is something mm -hmm. you've pioneered. And, and the book is something that I love the book. We talked about it on the last time you were on the show. I want to talk a little bit about you and, and founding the being the co-founder of the UFC, which is now this huge sport. Also, you know, discipline and self-control because i think to be successful there's still some basics that no matter what book you read mentor what ai software e-commerce so if you're not a disciplined person That's right. nothing works it's kind of like if you don't have air you can't live you know you can have a nice house and a car but if you're not breathing correctly or if you stop breathing it's over and i feel like yeah. now i want to get your opinion on this now with social media you see out in public, everybody's on their phone all the time. I'm guilty of it. You as somebody looking as like a grandmaster, not just of jujitsu, but you've learned so much in life. Do you think people need to really fight against the urge to have a short attention span? A hundred percent. It's not only, it's, it's the consequences of that, that we keep passing on to the kids, the next generation. They're just like a whole bunch of little zombies. They're, they're no longer, you know, they're stopping the, the connection with other human beings. It's a, it's a very sad situation. And of course, the internet can be a source of, you know, learning everything you want. You can have access to everything. It's very quick and that kind of stuff. It has this very strong beneficial side to it. But the, the side effects, the consequence of the other side also can be extremely uh, dangerous and, and damaging to people in general because of that uh, lack of human connection that is creating amongst us. It's very something to be very attentive to because uh, only God knows the consequence of something like this in the future. Yeah, I was just in, I was in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I, mm. I take, uh, there's a jujitsu school there. She's a Brazilian, uh, it's called Hive. She's from, she's Brazilian and she's a black belt and she teaches classes. But one nice thing there is you're not allowed to, you can't bring your phone on the mat. So for that one hour training, it's good. And it's funny, like people, one hour of not having their phone is a big deal for a lot of people. You know, people go to sleep and wake up on their phone. And so jujitsu, I think, don't you think it's a good, sports is a good way to just connect to the moment. Sports in general, whatever activity you're doing, if you can just, like you said, live that moment, doing that kind of activity is very beneficial. Especially now because it's so tempting to jump into a million different uh, you know, digital equipments and, and, and access to all kinds of stuff. And it's easy to get distracted with that. But yeah, you have to have developed the discipline, like you said, that you must be focused and, and, and prioritize what's really necessary and important for a healthy lifestyle. Especially now, it's just so easy to fall into the temptation of getting caught up on everything else.
an important one. What's your philosophy on, so if somebody's a busy entrepreneur, a lot of my followers, what do you think's the minimum? And I know maybe it's not a good question because you shouldn't think in minimum, but what's the minimum you think somebody should go to the gym, do jujitsu, do sports? Do you think it's every day is the minimum six days a week, seven days a week, or can somebody, you know, who's starting out do like, what do you think is that? answer i've heard people say that if you can you know exit go for a walk for 30 minutes three times a week it like increases your chance of improving your heart like 30 or 40 percent yeah because you eat every day you sleep every day you do a little bit of things every day i don't think there's no reason why you should not exercise every day or at least five days a week some yeah. kind of a walk or you know lift up a little bit of weight something find something to do five times a week would be great for you it's very important i think that would be the minimum that's what i try to do when you were yeah. training the pro athletes, you know, these, these that became these great fighters, did you do a lot of cross training? Like, did you want them to lift some weights, do some jogging? Like Mike Tyson's, you know, all over mm -hmm. social media now. And he talks about like, I'd wake up at three in the morning and I'd box and then I would hit the gym and then I would watch film of my opponents. Did you like that kind of variety or did you just like, let's just do jujitsu for eight hours? You know, I'm, I'm old school, you know, time. I, uh, I grew up doing jiu-jitsu since I was a, literally a baby. I had diapers under my first gi. And then all I did all my life was jiu-jitsu. That's the only yeah. thing I ever did, you know? Uh, now I am doing a little bit with weights, you know, two or three times a week. And I'm going for my walks and doing that kind of stuff. But growing up, I spend, you know, as soon as I start teaching at like 14 or 15, I would spend, you know, if I'm not in school for four or five hours a day, I was teaching classes. So huh. my life is literally being spent on the mat teaching classes. And of course, sparring with my students throughout the day is a great exercise as well. Teaching from like seven o'clock in the morning until like one o'clock in the afternoon, go home, have a bite to eat, take a nap for 15, 20 minutes, and then go back to teach again from like three o'clock to nine o'clock at night. So I spend, you know, most of my life on that schedule. Uh, exercising with a little bit of weight and, and running and sprints, all that kind of thing can only help, especially if you're going to be a professional athlete where your priority is not staying home teaching someone, which was yeah. my case. Um, I never thought about being a professional athlete. I fell into the challenge matches, hundreds of them that I had when I first came to America because I needed to prove the effectiveness of jiu-jitsu. But I never trained to be a professional athlete. I was just naturally pushed into a jiu-jitsu lifestyle, and, uh, which I, I loved every second of it. Instead of you know competing and winning a medal, I always preferred to be, be a very good teacher and transform someone's life. I saw hmm. that as, as my calling, you know? And, huh. um, and like I said, when I came to America and moved here to 1978, and I started teaching class out of my garage, I would teach classes one after the other. And some people would say, oh, my karate instructor, kung fu instructor is jealous that I'm no longer training with them. He wants to challenge you to a fight. I would say, well, bring the guy in here and we'll find out. So they would bring the instructor to the garage to fight me. And uh, because Jiu Jitsu is indeed the most effective form of self-defense, it would give me the elements of subduing the opponent in a very humane way, get him in a clinch, take him to the ground, and without having to beat anybody, I let the guy wore, you know, wear himself out for 30 seconds, and he'd be so exhausted <laughs> that I give up. And uh, most of the guys, because they saw the ease and the simplicity of the effectiveness of jiu-jitsu, they would say, hey, yeah. can I learn this stuff? And even though they were instructions of other martial arts, they walked yeah. out of there, you know, wanting to sign up for jiu-jitsu classes, my friends, and telling everybody about that. So that's how the how the, that's how the West was won. But that's how the West was won. All I did is jujitsu all my life. I never was very much into working out with much weight and doing this because, like I said, I wasn't a professional athlete per se, but uh, I was mainly a jujitsu teacher, and I'm very happy that I spent my years doing that. So, on the challenges, how many of those challenges did you win? Countless. I mean, all of them. Oh, Every really? Season. So you were basically you won all of them? Yeah. I won all of them. Yeah, hundreds of them. <laughs> what was the closest to who? Who did the best? Was it the karate guys? Was it the wrestlers? Like, who was the naturally the best against Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Well, the karate, the, the karate, taekwondo, you know, kung fu, boxer. Those guys are very efficient. Don't take me wrong. A strike can really knock someone out. It's as simple as that. The yeah. difference is, you know, a wrestler, for example, is more accustomed with the grappling aspect of it or even right. a judo guy who's more accustomed to that, they can last a little bit longer, but still they don't know what's coming. The objective of a judo guy is to put, throw you on the ground and put your back on the ground. For them, that's right. the end of the jujitsu. The fight's just beginning. I don't mind if yeah. you throw me on the ground and then yeah. I go to your back and choke you out or catch you on an armlock. 
Same thing with the yeah. wrestler. The wrestler wants to pin my back to the ground. He pins yes. my back to the ground in between my legs. I can choke him out. I can catch one arm lock and put him on a triangle. For me, yeah. being my back on the ground is irrelevant. So Jiu-Jitsu yeah. has this much more objective goal, which is yeah. to submit the opponent, not just to score a point on your opponent. So, yes. you know, strikers of karate, like I said, you know, punchers and kickers, those guys would come to spot with me in the garage. They had no idea that I had no problem in getting into a clinch because the issue with those guys is if they stay too far, they can't strike you because their hand can't reach you. But in order to get closer to be able to hit me, as soon as they start getting close enough, I jump in and catch them. So yeah, close the, the distance, yeah. So the opportunity they had to strike at me is very short. And odds are in my favor, you know, that I'm going to get into yeah. a clinch, get him to the ground, not going to give him the space to start again. Before they know it, they're already on the ground and that's the fight's over. So it's not me, Ty, let yeah. me remind you of that. It's not that I am good. It's that I know something that is just absolutely magical. As we yeah. say in Brazil, in a blind man's land, he who has one eye is king. So right. I'm it. <laughs> so you were maybe you think you were 500 and 0, maybe or something 800 and 0. How many challenge matches do you think I you don't had? I know it's countless. For 10 years, I literally had hundreds of challenge matches. People would say, "Hey, yeah. can I bring my instructors?" I yeah, sure, bring it on. And I'll tell <laughs> my students, you know, hey, come check it out. Such and such guys coming up Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And the students would bring their friends. For me, it was a great marketing strategy because the people would bring their friends and they get impressed with that. Like I said, yeah. I didn't have to hurt the instructors. Most of the guys who came to challenge me walked out of there, my friends and students of mine. So they mm. just kind of multiplied like this. It was a really, really good time, you know. Yeah, my, 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 one of my brothers, he trained with Marco Huas, who was UFC winner number eight or something. Oh, that yeah, kind yeah. of valetudo, the strong guy. But my brother is the first one who really told me I was wanting to do. I had done judo first time when I was like 12, did a little bit, and then – I was going back and I was like, I'm going to do karate. And my brother's like, oh, I used to do Taekwondo. And I met these guys from Brazil. And he's like, Don't, and he's like, challenge match. He, he said his teacher got destroyed. Maybe he went, maybe his teacher went against you. Cause he's like, I see my teacher got destroyed, you know, like from Japan or Korea, 30 years of training got beat in 10 seconds by a jujitsu person. So that, that's what got me into jujitsu. And obviously I don't have the time to, I wish I had, you know, I, I have to balance it. But um, let me ask you this, because we were talking before we started the show, changing the subject for a second, the Gracie diet and self-discipline and all this. You were telling me you went down to Central America and they tested your biological age. What did you say that the, the number was? Um, well, I, went to, I stepped on a machine while doing an uh, examination down there. And uh, the, the doctor enters your age, your height, and uh, your age, your height, and your weight. And the oh. machine reads your body age. And I okay. did that at the end of last year. Well, I was still 70. I just turned 71 a few months ago. And uh, at the time, the machine read my body is at 45. Wow. And the doctor was really blown away because he said, I've never seen a 70-year-old guy with a body of a 45. And really? Said, what do you attribute that to? She said, absolutely, your diet. And uh, mm. which doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, people nowadays eat all kinds of junk, as you know. Processed food is in everything you do everywhere. And uh, thanks to my Uncle Carlos, my father's older brother, the guy who first learned Jiu-Jitsu, in fact, in the Gracie family, uh, he realized back in the early 20s the important correlation between good performance and good health. So although he was not a doctor, back in the late 20s, early 30s, he started studying nutrition reading the works of doctors and scientists and nutritionists, nutritionists anything he, put, he, put, he could put his hands on. And the result was that he came up with a concept of food combining, which for him was the essence of proper health, to keep your body alkaline. And the way you mix foods at each meal is what really makes a greasy diet, which is not a restrictive diet at all, unique from all the other concepts of you know, eating out there. It's not that you mm -hmm. can't eat. It's not a restrictive diet, like I said. You can basically eat whatever you want as long as you combine the foods properly at each meal. Mm -hmm. For example, for breakfast today, I had one cantaloupe, a fresh squeezed one cantaloupe, which is two big, large glasses. I put in a blender with four bananas, mm -hmm. okay? And then I got the meat, the coconut meat, just the, the, mm -hmm. you know, not the water, but the meat of the coconut. I blended that all together and had that for breakfast. 
But it's not all, a it's not a vegan diet, right? It I mean no. you have cottage cheese and you have meat and all these kind of things. Yeah, but you can eat whatever you want. Like I said, you combine your food. Now if you're a vegetarian, you can be a vegetarian within the concepts of the Gracie diet. You mm -hmm. know, you can eat whatever you want. That doesn't matter. It's a combination of foods is what determines this stuff. So mm -hmm. I haven't had lunch yesterday, but yesterday I had a, a crab risotto with a salad. In my salad, I put olive oil and garlic and salt, olive oil and salt. And then do not put lime on your salad because lime okay. is acidic fruit and that right. will mess up the whole meal. Okay. Or some people would have a piece of fish and just because of habit, they put a squeeze of lime over their fish. It might huh. taste good because you're accustomed to do that, but it ruins your meal. So in the Gracie diet, according to the Gracie diet, you should not put a lime on your fish. Wow, it okay. tastes so good. People are so accustomed to do that. I understand. And more often than not, we just develop certain eating habits and keep those habits because it tastes good. In yeah. other words, the pleasure of the food, the taste of the food becomes a determining factor why we eat certain things and we don't eat other things. You like it, you eat it. You don't like it, you don't eat it. The mm. problem is a lot of things that you like are not good for your health. Mm -hmm. People have to become aware of that. That's the yeah. tricky part. I was fortunate enough to be born into a family where not only Jiu-Jitsu was a priority for us to train since we were little babies, like I said, but my baby bottles were watermelon juice blended with bananas. So there was somebody hmm. thinking about that for me before I was even understanding what was going on. We would go, I remember going to birthday parties when I'm five, six years old with my brothers and uh, I get to the party and the, the father of the, or the mother of the, the child, you know, celebrating the birthday would give us a piece of cake and I would say, thank you very much. It's not my time to eat. Now I'm five huh. years old. The people wow. say, hey, call my dad. Say, what's going on? There's a birthday party. Your, your son is telling me that it's not his time to eat. That's because my father was careful enough to number one, teach us that we shouldn't eat somewhere else because, you know, this food sometimes would not combine according to our guidelines. But more importantly, he would make sure to feed us dinner before we went. So we went in a mm. full tummy. So I'm not tempted to eat a, a piece of chocolate cake because I'm hungry. So the old man had all that yeah. carefully. He would explain to the father, you know, we have a certain way of eating. Don't worry. They just went there to play with their friends and stuff like that. But teaching us the concept of discipline, like you're talking about, is yeah. crucial because I learned to eat. This is okay. This is not okay. The same yeah. way I said no to a piece of cake when I was a kid, when a teenager would say, no, thank you very much for a joint or, or a glass of Coke or, you know, or beer. I learned that certain things are beneficial, some things are not beneficial. And this is kind of stuff you'll learn at home. And I was, like yeah. I said, fortunate to be in an environment where health and priority and, and exercise and training and stuff, was, this was priority in our lives, a very Spartan lifestyle. And then yeah. uh, as I grew up, you know, I spent all my life growing up, you opened the fridge in my house. There was never, you know, a bottle of wine or a beer or, you know, drinks and stuff. Never such a thing because my father didn't drink. So he mm. kind of set the example for us. It was easy to put fruits and vegetables all the time. And I'm not saying it's wrong the person to drink. I mean, anybody can do whatever they want, of course. But in our house, it was a priority because my father tells me that when he was growing up, 13 years old, he went on a fishing trip with some friends and somebody opened a bottle of cachaça. It's a very like a tequila kind of drink. You know? Yeah, yeah. And he was the youngest guy on the boat at 13, and he tried it, and he absolutely loved it. So he came home, <laughs> told him to Carlos, my, 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 his brother, said, Carlos, I found my drink. It's cachaça. <laughs> Carlos said to him, Elio, don't drink, because you're never going to find anything good for you at the, at the bottom of a bottle. And my huh. father never drank again. Not really? in my whole life. That was, he was 13 years old at the time. Never in my whole life I saw my dad with a glass of empty glass of champagne to say happy new year. Never, ever, ever. It doesn't touch drink at all because huh. he never drank. He felt the importance of don't drinking, no, not drinking. And you want to set up an example for us. Yeah. And in terms of raising a child, example is not the best way to educate your kids. It's the only way. Mm. Imagine if I light up a cigarette and tell my kid, don't smoke. Or if I'm drinking, I say to the kid, don't drink. It's not going to work. As soon as he has a chance with his friends, and somebody brings a cigarette, he's going to try it because mom or dad are doing it. It's yeah. an implicit way to say it's okay. So you have to be that example so that you can have not only the respect from the kids, but lead by example. That's the only way it works. Yeah, otherwise it doesn't work. Same thing, like I said, you know, I never drank. So my kids growing up, they open the fridge, there's fruits and vegetables. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And then, uh, now it doesn't say they can't drink if they don't want to. Whatever, anybody can do whatever they want. In fact, there's a chapter on the Gracie Diet book 
that I talk about if you enjoy drinking once in a while, okay, whatever, it's your party, your, your choice. But at least eat right. You know what I'm saying? Eat right the whole week. Yeah. And on the weekend, we have a glass of wine or champagne. Yeah, well, well. <laughs> but if you eat right the whole week, you much more, it'll be much more beneficial than if you say, well, I want to drink. So, you know, mess up the diet, throw it away. And I don't care anyway. No, you should think about what you're eating because it makes a huge difference. The discipline, there's no way around it. There's, there's two kinds of pains. You know that. There's the pain of discipline and the pain of regret. So yeah. it's worth investing on in your discipline, whatever it takes to make you healthier. Because my friend, I'm telling you, you're too young still, but at 71, the, the bill will come. It's mm. worth investing on your life, on your health, because uh, as you get older, I realize that it's amazing what I can do today. I ride my horse and I train jujitsu. I do everything I did, you know, a little slower than maybe, but the energy is there. I wake up in the morning, 6.30 every morning, just, you know, at 300 miles an hour. I don't need to drink coffee. I'm like, you know, always ready to go and enjoy my So are you, not a big, are you not a big caffeine person? Zero coffee. If I drink coffee, I'll fly everywhere, man. I'll really. <laughs> <laughs> you have too much energy already. Too much energy, that's right. In fact, your and your dad coffee. was like that. Did, didn't your dad at ninety five still he could do jujitsu and yeah. handstands or something? I saw a video one time. What wasn't he like that? Yeah, Uncle Carlos again lived until he was yeah. like ninety two or ninety three years old. Was doing a handstand when he's eighty something or something like that. You know. Yeah. And then my dad. Last time I saw my father, I went to visit him on his ranch in Brazil. He was 94 and a half, six mm. months before he passed away. I get mm. to the ranch, he gave me a kiss and said, hold on, let's go on the mat. I want to show you a new choke I'm working on. And kick my butt at 94 and a half. You know what wow. I'm saying? So that was, that's for me, is a, it, my opportunity to see Uncle Carlos and my dad and the elderly having not only living long lives, Ty, but they had good quality of life. My yeah. father just kind of, it, it, it's an example that I want to, I want to get to that point. That's what I'm hoping for. And based on what I've been doing today, the way I feel today, I'm, I'm on track to do that. One thing I heard you say when you're talking about your earlier, you were saying your schedule, you know, you would teach and you would take a nap, sleep for a second. So yeah. what's your philosophy on how many hours of sleep somebody should have minimum and then also things like naps? What's kind of your view? I think sleep is it's crucial, right? It's one of the most important things in your life. You should sleep as much as you can at night. I usually go to bed around 10 o'clock, 10.30, and wake up at 6. So I try to get seven hours of sleep at least. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I try to do for myself. Were you always like that? Were you getting, did you used to get more or less? What, when you were, you know, training, was it the same, seven, eight hours? Yes. Now, as you get older, you tend to need less sleep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock is when I go to bed. I usually go about 6 o'clock, something like that, 6, 7. So, I so did you to, use did you used to sleep in a little bit later? Like if you went to bed at ten, you would sleep till like seven. Yeah, when you're younger, because of my schedule of teaching classes, I would go to bed at ten o'clock, ten thirty, eleven o'clock, and then wake up at six o'clock in the morning because I had to go to work. You know, yeah, teaching again. I mean, or school, you know, that kind of thing. So my schedule yeah. was that. If I can't sleep seven, eight hours a day, I'm okay. And but I would try to do it then, and I still do it today. Is take a nap every single. If I have a chance after lunch, I'll take a nap. I think it's, really. It's a major yeah. recharging thing, and I highly recommend people to do that. Especially have you trained your body to easily fall asleep? You know, you said 15-minute nap. Do, do I you call, eat? If I lay in bed after, after a meal, I'll sleep. In five minutes, I'm sleeping. Really? I'll sleep do you set a timer minutes. to wake yourself up, or you just wake up in 15 minutes or so? No, I wake up in 15 minutes or so. That's usually, it's a very quick nap. If I sleep like for an hour, an hour and a half, then I'll get lazy and sluggish after that. It wears me out too much. All I need is yeah. a 15 to 30 minutes nap. That's all I need. What about <laughs> stretching? Were, are you big into yoga? I mean, because partly, you know, I, I have a program that I've launched called 150 Body, which is kind of a fitness and training and how you can, as a busy entrepreneur, stay in good shape. And yes. I have a lesson in there called Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, 150 Kareem, the basketball player. You yeah. know, he was, he played into his 40s, which was really, back back in the 1970s and 80s pro basketball players were smoking doing cocaine drinking and most of them retired or got hurt around age 35 10 uh -huh. years longer and he said his big thing was doing yoga flexibility yes. so in jujitsu you have to do if you're not flexible you're gonna get hurt right away do right. you build in even now and back then do you wait what's kind of your first 30 minutes when you wake up. What what have, I, what do you believe? I stretch you, every morning. Really? For about 30 minutes. Yes. Oh, that long. Morning. Okay. 
So is that the first thing? What Walk me through the first 30 to 60 minutes of when you wake up, because I think that's an important time. What What do you think is the best daily routine you've ever done? First thing I do in the morning is drink a glass of water. You know, I bring the, the water to the bedroom with Nick's next to the table, drink a glass of water. I will um, wake up in the morning and I'll stretch for about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and mm-hmm. then go out, make breakfast, and then uh, feed my horse, and then mm-hmm. go back in the house, make breakfast for the kids that are waking up and that kind of stuff, and then uh, jump to do my phone calls, Brazil, Europe, whatever, take care of business like that. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes a little rolling with my kids and I'll go for a walk or just kind of, you know, that's my day starts with that. But a, that's a lot. That's 20 minutes of stretching. I feel like you're only as old as your mobility. Once mobility right. and balance goes, you're done. As long as you're limber, you're young. That is correct. I agree with that. Yeah. 100%. Now for everybody watching in the show notes, if you go to tylopez.com slash Horion, it's with a R. Actually, let me put, I'll make an easier link. TyLopez.com slash Gracie podcast. We'll have a link to the Gracie diet book. It's a very fascinating book. I've had it for years. It's something that I remember one of the things that I liked a lot in that book was just this concept that it's not so much about people think too much like, is it vegan? Is it this? Is it that? Is it carnivore? But you see healthy people who are carnivore and Tell that people are vegan. So it has to be something else. It's not just exactly. And so for those of you watching, go, you can also see, we'll put a link to the last uh, podcast episode that we did a few years ago, where we have even more on the, on the uh, Gracie diet. I'll have the link to uh, Grandmaster Horion's website, link to his Instagram, follow him there. Um, One thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, bloodline. I think I wanted to get your opinion. I think my philosophy is if you just think about it in a simple but but smart way, the purpose of life on earth, I don't know what happens after we die, but it's your bloodline. It's your friends that are closer sometimes than a brother. That's like your family. It's the family you're born with, but it's all the also the family and the children you have and the grandkids and then, you know, romance. So you, am I right that you had how many how many children and grandchildren do you have? Because it's not it's enough. it's more than one. You, did you say not enough? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have ten kids. I have ten kids and fourteen grandchildren. Wow. Do you have and great grandchildren? Not yet. Not yet. Not, so a, my my first uh, da- granddaughter is twenty seven years old. So soon enough, I guess. And then your brother also had how many? Uh, he also has ki- uh, five kids. Hoyle, uh, Hickson has had four kids. Hoyle had four. Hobby has two daughters. Hoka has two kids. Each one of them has, you know. And what about your dad and uncle? How many kids did they have? Uncle Carl had 21 kids. Wow, he had 21. Wow. 21 kids, yes. And your father had? My father had nine. Nine. So there was 30 kids among the two. So you have a lot of uncles. I have a lot of, yeah, well, cousins. I had five uncles because my father's brothers are four of them. Four oh, that's four, right? Three years, yeah. Yeah. But cousins, yes. A lot of cousins and big family. We had, we grew up in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, we had a summer house on the outskirts of Rio in a place yeah. called Teresopolis. Which is like okay. a basically compound with 21 bedrooms and 18 bathrooms. 21 so bedrooms. Summer vacations and holidays and stuff like that. And the place was just absolutely incredible. Uh, my mother would run the place like a five star hotel. We had uh, horses and the, and we had 18 uniformed employees that worked at the house. With wow. Tags, you know, the gardeners, the horse keepers, everything else. We had an in-house bakery. The guy was making bread every day with, you know, a little hmm. oven, uh, brick oven and stuff like that. Just making bread, like on bakery inside the house. It's crazy. And on Christmas, my mother would decorate the house, you know, with the Christmas tree and all that kind of stuff. And, and the kids would be eating dinner. And then we had this big, huge veranda that looked out into the front of the house. And after dinner, the kids would be anxiously waiting. And then suddenly you look out into the pitch black and you see Santa Claus materializing, riding in a black stallion towards the house. That's my wow. dad dressed as Santa Claus with a beard flying and a bag of toys on his back, running towards the house. You stop the horse on the bottom here, put a ladder, climb into the living room with the kids, hand out the presents to all everybody else, and then disappear into the night. 
you know, growing up with that kind of experience was just something absolutely unforgettable. I think I was about, you know, maybe 12 years old when I eventually saw his wrist, you know, under the Santa Claus outfit. I said, hey, I know that wrist. I <laughs> kept my mouth shut, didn't say anything. But it was such an amazing experience to grow up in that kind of a family with that kind of group of people. It's just unique that for 40 years, literally 40 years, all my kids saw me getting dressed as Santa Claus without knowing it was me, you know. And then as they found out, they kept quiet for the newer ones not to know. And a couple of years ago, I finally retired for my youngest kids. So it was, it was, it's been an interesting uh, ride for me to, to be able to carry on that kind of tradition for the kids, let them experience firsthand what it was I had, you know. Yeah, I've talked to you before. And sometimes I think I'm like, sounds like you almost had created your family the best life possible a family could build, a human could have on earth. You guys, you know, I talk about the four pillars of the good life. Health, wealth, love, happiness, you know, and each of those break down. But health, obviously, you and your family is one of the healthiest families, athletes, wealth. You created this big brand and business. It's one of the most well-known business brands. Love, you have all this family. And and, and I've been around you and, and it seems like people are very happy. I think Brazilians are. I actually saw a new study. Brazilians have the least about a mental illness in the world. They're just happy people. So, I mean, I feel like you almost figured out the formula. And I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, say it in too dramatic of a way, but I know billionaires, you know, they don't have that good. Of, you, the Gracie family, I, I know multiple people on the Forbes list. If I had a choice, I'd rather be in your family than be in that family because it, it's you got it all. And, and, and also at the end of the day, if you don't have social life, friends, family, romance, you don't have anything. Our brain is hardwired to be happy in proportion to our social life. And you can't compensate for that by just having money. So do you sometimes feel like you have, do you, have, do you see other people and ever think, oh, they had it better? Or do you kind of sometimes go, wow, I had it about as good as anyone on earth? Um, I definitely think I was blessed being a born in a family like this. Um, I must tweak a little thing in there. You mentioned the four nice, beautiful things you've said. You forgot to, to mention chokes because in a family like mine, as people grow up, they all become more proficient fighters. And therefore, yes. the, you know, being choked by someone should be part of the package too. So, Health, <laughs> wealth, love, happiness, you. and being choked by a family member. And being choked by a family member. This is part of the deal. <laughs> but I consider myself, uh, for, I don't know if for the the timing, whatever the situation was, extremely blessed, you know, Ty, for being born in a family under the circumstances I was. Um, mm -hmm. Uncle Carlos, who was the shaman of the Gracie family, used to say that the Gracie family is a small sample of mankind. Mm -hmm. If you want to pay the highest compliments to an individual, he's in the Gracie family. But also mm -hmm. the scale of the earth is on the Gracie family. If I want to talk bad stuff about some people, don't think the Gracie are perfect. By all means, they're not. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of crazy people in there. Like, like I said, it's every kind of person in here. I don't have mm. to go talk, you know, bad stuff or, or find, you know, problems with people outside the family. They're all in the family, too. So you have that scale of all kinds of things. And I think mm. for me, it has been a very unique opportunity to have access to all this kind of personalities and people and attitudes and, and, and ways of behaving and doing things proper and improper and all kinds of stuff. Just to have that little separate world that we have in the family is, for me, it's an opportunity that is absolutely unique, you know. And uh, yeah. all, with all that said and done, I consider myself extremely fortunate. I wouldn't want to have it any other way. And, uh, do you think that the, do you think the life philosophy, you know, your bloodline is the because when I asked you how many children to have, you specifically said not enough. Do, not is enough. that were you joking or do you really, really believe that? Do you really, do really you think a large that. family is an amazing goal that people yeah, should I have? I have uh, I have. Uh, you know, three kids with my, I was married three times. The first one, I had two, two daughters. Then I had okay. five kids with a second wife. And with my current yep. wife, I have three children. But we lost okay. three kids. So I wish I had those three kids more. You know what I'm saying? Huh. Well, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. With God's will. Bottom line is that, you know, you, each kid, the way I see it, it's mm -hmm. for me, for example, sex is for procreation. Right. That's what I see. You know, not that you can't enjoy it, but I have never been, you know, promoting the idea of, well, let's have sex, but make sure that you don't get pregnant. <clears throat> mm. That sentence never came out of my mouth. In right. fact, I've been in situations before I was married or whatever, 
that uh, if I'm, you know, about to have sex, the girl said, absolutely, I can't have kids no matter what, I'm out. Really? Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah what would you think? It's, I have a program called 13 Thesis. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a program up for men and women, but entrepreneurs on how to find love, dating, build a family. So what is your advice to a man who meets a woman on, on the first date? She's like, I don't think I ever want to have kids. Um, if that was you, if that was you, what would you do? If I believe she doesn't want to have, because what happens is, is I understand that a lot of women don't have kids because they don't feel the confidence on the man they're with. Right. The man has to inspire confidence so that she feels like good. Because her instinct as a female is to have a child. That's what mm-hmm. makes her a woman. Now, she might be scared. She might have been going through a bad experience and say, I don't want to have any more kids because she was traumatized. I understand and respect that. But it's up to the man to earn her respect and say, well, with this guy, I want to have a kid. See what I'm saying? So it's a guy has to change. He has to be that, that type of a man that she feels secure enough with him that she would want to do that. Because mm-hmm. if I have, you know, I don't want to have, I don't want to get married to a woman who doesn't want to have kids. My yeah. instinct as a man is that I want to, I want to procreate. I want to, I want to get the, like you said, my genes. I want to keep that carry on. I want somebody to carry on what I have. So yeah. I think there's a mutual understanding on that, you know? And, and when you think about, I want to have one kid only, I want to have two kids only. For me, that thing never never made sense because when you mm-hmm. have a child, that mm-hmm. transforms your life. Yeah. If you think, if you think that you you know you love a kid very much, if you love that one child so much, why wouldn't you have a second one? Right. You're not going to divide your love. You're going to multiply your love. Yeah. And if you have three kids, you're not going to. Oh, it's going to be just one third of love for each one of them. No, you're going to love them just as much. In other words, mm-hmm. the more kids you have, the more love you have within you to share wow. with them. That's the way I yeah. see it. That's what mm-hmm. I think people should see it. Now, so, like I said, sometimes the woman is not trusty, confident enough on the man that he can provide for her. You know what I'm saying? And I understand that concern. I respect that. She makes sense with that thing. So it's up to the guy to make sure she understands that she he's going to be doing everything inside and out to her. It's up to him to provide it and convince her that he can be the man that she's going to do it, what she hopes for, that kind of thing. So that mindset, I guess, it has to be able to, to complement each other. But if she says, I don't want to get kids no matter what, so it's like mm-hmm. we're just going to go out, hang out, and, and, and be friends and, and, and have fun and no kids, it becomes yeah. a very light connection, I don't think. It's going to not get yeah. as deep as you could. When you have a kid, I mean, you're, you're in. Unfortunately, a lot of people have the kids by accident. Now they're stuck together. Now they're yeah. stuck because she got pregnant. And now they have to stay together. And that becomes a war inside, and that's not something they wanted. Like I said, all my kids were very much wanted, every single one of them, because yeah. I already go in with my fingers crossed and hope she gets pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the idea, because once she gets pregnant, it's, it's a blessing of that connection. It's an it's a, it's yeah. a ultimate you know, connection if you can you know, generate a baby with that woman that you love and you care for, and she does the same for you. That's the only way to go. So what's your advice to a guy? Let's say you're giving advice and he's, he's an entrepreneur. Like, Do you think... You should have kids relatively early. Do you think you should wait? Do you, like, what's kind of your thought? My, my rule of thumb is don't get married before you're 30. Number one, mm-hmm. you shouldn't do that. And you should, I personally think you should not have sex with a woman that you would not want her to see the mother of your children. Mm. If every, every time people had sex with someone else, they, before that, they say, what if this person gets pregnant? Would I be happy with this, in, with, with this arrangement? <laughs> if yeah. you say, absolutely not, get out. Really? Save your energy for the next one that you want to be with for the rest of your life. Because I think a lot of men need to hear that because a lot of people are kind of like, well, you know, this woman, but this happened to one of my close friends. He got a girl pregnant. I was, and he's like, I'm going to marry her because she, and I remember being like, this is not the kind of woman for you. You're not, and it 10 years later ended in a just nasty kind of, uh-huh. you know breakup and it's hard on the kids and so so how how would you as a man in the modern world because it's changed a lot you know how 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 would you date like would you you know would you be super picky would you go out with a lot of women and then just like one date one date one date to see who you really liked or would you kind of focus down would you ask a lot of questions up front or would you let it evolve just slowly what what would be kind of your philosophy you see people are very you know sex and food are the great pleasures of life mm-hmm. everything we do is to ultimately have sex or eat good food those are the big yeah. pleasures people are not to 
you're going to make a lot of money so that you can find a very special woman and impress her by taking her to a fancy hotel so you can eat good food and ultimately end up in bed. That's yeah. basically what the whole thing comes down to. <laughs> That's just it. Yeah, yeah. You know, for, for sure. So Simple pleasures. Things, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you want to have some kind of fun. The problem is that people get weakened by the idea of sex and food. You know, a, a delicious food. People eat that stuff sometimes feeling, I'm going to feel sick afterward. Mm -hmm. I went to do a lecture in Denmark a few, a few years ago, you know, in, a, in a, the guy who owns a restaurant called Noma. Rene yeah, Noma. Restaurant. Noma, yes. Yeah. The guy who owns the restaurant used to put together an event every year, bringing the most influential chefs in the world. To, he, put, he built a little tent in the island in Denmark. He invited me to talk about the Gracie diet. Oh, and wow. 600 of the most influential chefs, and I am talking about the Gracie diet, right? Wow. So during the conversation, I told them that a friend of mine, who's a very renowned chef, told me that the objective of every chef is to make a food that, number one, looks good because you start eating with your eyes. Number two, smells good because the aroma is something very tempting and very, you know, anticipation of what's coming. And it must look good, smell good, and taste good. That's what he told me. Uh -huh. That's what the objective of every chef. I asked him, what about being good for you? He said, that. Oh, that's not priority. Forget that. If the food looks good, huh. smells good, and tastes good, I know they come back next week. That's what I want. Yeah. I never forgot that. So during this lecture with these chefs from all over the world, two-star Michelin, three-star Michelin, Michelin stars all over the place, uh, TV shows, the guys, all kinds of chefs in there. I told them that story, and I mentioned to them that I also like a food that looks good, smell good, and taste good. But for me, the most important thing is that I feel it's good for me afterwards. Yeah. And I said, I have a challenge to every one of you, to the chefs. Go to your, your favorite restaurant, ask for the most expensive plate on the menu, followed by the most elaborate dessert in the menu. By the time you get home, you're not feeling good. Yeah. You're gonna feel like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Then you gotta take some uh, alka seltzer or some, you know, uh, pepto or whatever to feel good because you're feeling bad afterwards. Yeah. If I'm gonna get my wife all decked up, schedule an appointment to a restaurant, spend a lot of money, eat a food and come home, feel sick. That's yeah. basic stupidity. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not worth it for me. The way I see it is I want to have a food that I enjoy eating, but ultimately makes me feel good afterwards. And yeah. that's the concept for me of the Gracie, that developing the discipline of yeah. knowing what to choose so that the result ultimately is beneficial for you and not enjoy something for a half an hour, a good meal, and come home feeling sick afterwards. It's not, it's not what I'm at. Sex yeah. is the same thing. You should choose a person that you're going to have sex with, not just be weakened by the pleasures of sex, but understand that it's much more profound than that. It's through sex that people procreate that you generate a new life. It's not just something that you're going to have fun with that for a second and just throw it away. This is not it. So people are paying yeah. the, 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 say the price for their momentary bad choices for the momentary pleasure without thinking about the consequence of that you know so yeah. like you said you get a guy who's getting married sees a good attractive good looking woman and has sex with her at a great moment with her but she is freaking not worth the, you know it's not that kind of a person that you think she is and before you know it now you're stuck you have a child with that woman and she's stuck with you know the whole thing is a big mess it's not good so take your time to be a yeah. little more careful with your choices and uh I what do you think is the biggest know. red flag it, for a guy looking for a woman? Like, what do you think? What would be a red flag for you of like, oh, this isn't a good match for me? You might be a better expert at that than I am, Ty. <laughs> oh, I don't know. No, I don't yeah, think I so. Belt, man. I'm very low-key, <laughs> old school. I'm very picky. If the woman says this, kids is out of the question, it's like, I'm out. Yeah. I'm not, for me, no deal. You know? Because she doesn't see me as a person that she would respect, admire, and want to have a kid with. Mm. I'm using her, but she's using me too, you know, mm. and I, I, this is not the kind of relationship I want, you know, I'm, mm. I, like I said, I'm old school, I think, you know, I want someone that I can connect with in a much more, in a deeper level, because when, you know, I don't want to get religious here, but nature gave us the, you know, the, the way to generate a child mm -hmm. is through a pleasurable experience, right? Mm -hmm. Having sex with someone is like the ultimate pleasure, you know, that kind of thing. That's the intensity of it is so profound it's so connecting it's so meaningful that you actually generate a child as a result of that you should not be wasting that vital energy like all the time with everybody that's you're you're just 
you're playing God. You want to have the fun of it, but you're not really take the consequences of that. Yeah. You're making sure she's like, you know, on a birth control pill or, you know, you're using a contraceptive, you know, whatever, whatever that is. You're using that to make sure that, listen, let's have fun, but let's not take the consequence. And I think that's yeah. abusing the laws of the, the, the pleasures and the, and the laws of nature because you want to have just a good part, but I don't want to take the consequence of that. I can't, I can't do that. It's not in me to do that, you know. Like I said, I've been in a situation before, being you know in bed with someone, and she said, "Absolutely can't get pregnant." I just can't get excited. I'm just thank you very much. We'll live next time. Yeah. Just it, my my head is like I mean, you know taught to think that way, and it, it's that's where I am. So the biggest red flag for me is the fact that if she is, you know, I don't know, meet someone first, get to know her, forget the sex part, and just think about the what would she be as a as a wife or a mother or something like that. Because there's no more significant contribution that a woman can do than being raising a family. Yeah. If you're looking at a woman just as a piece of meat that you're going to have fun with that, at that time, you're, you're missing the boat. You should respect the woman because she's absolutely priced. But she has to make herself worthy of that by having the right mindset and understanding that and just, you know, being with you for the right reasons as well. It's, it's kind of a tricky thing. Might be a long, a longer conversation than what we're having right now. So, what does somebody do who's listening that's not in that kind of relationship? Do you think you just cut the cord and you have a conversation? You say this isn't going to work out, and you be brave and move on, or do you just say, "Well, I'm already in it, so I'm gonna, I got to stick with the bad situation." What's the Gracie philosophy there? I, you know, the Gracie philosophy of me is like, hey, listen, find someone that you can, that you can look at and say, I, I respect enough this woman. And I appreciate her qualities and talents that I see that she could be a mother for one of my kids. Just have sex for the fun of it. Like I said, it's not that you shouldn't enjoy sex. By all means, you should. There's not, this is why nature gave us the pleasure of sex. Because if you had to have a child, if in order to have a child, a person had to cut one finger off, clear, right. <laughs> would, would the be humans no would be gone. gone. Yeah. yeah. See, the, the civilization would have ended a long time ago. But nature, in its infinite wisdom, made sure that procreation happens to a pleasurable experience. So people go out, have one night stand, the woman gets pregnant, the guy goes away, she goes away. Before you know it, there's one more kid who's in love, um, you know, not guided properly. It's one more problem. And the world is going what we're going through. There will be no overpopulation if people look at each other and chose properly before they went to bed and have, you know, have sex. Do you think that's the root of a lot of the world's problems now? Is it just kids that didn't grow up with guidance? Yeah, of course. Are you kidding? Yeah. yeah, the kids grow up and no problem, no father, no no mother, whatever. This is, you know, no guy, no love. Being brought up by someone else and pushed into the system is horrible. So, um, yeah, tricky stuff. Yeah, but but important. And and one more thing before we start to wrap up here, but with this philosophy, you know, nature and God, what do you think of, so porn, a lot of guys who are 25 years old, online porn, what do you think that's doing to the world? Your head's already screwed up. No, forget that. But it's, t you know, guys are like, oh, I'm tempted, beautiful women, da, da, da. Do you think it's keeping people from bonding correctly? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't watch porn. It's not my thing at all. Zero. Yeah. And then um, I don't know what to say. I mean, people are actually hooked on that because yeah. there's some kind of an imbalance, I guess. Yeah. One way or the other, you want to find that kind of satisfaction, but it's endless because you're never going to get there. You know, it's like, that's a, it's a, a situation to specifically get you hooked on that kind of mindset. I mean, it's it's unfortunate. Wake up, yeah. go for a run, you know, do some 50 push-ups and run for a few miles and come back and go train and, you know, change your mindset, become a better person so that you can attract a woman that's worthy of you. Look yeah. at yourself, have higher expect expectations of yourself, make yourself a better person so that you can be in a level that you can find someone better. Because if you're yeah. down here, man, that's what you're going to find is people that's down there with you. You want to find yeah. someone better, you have to raise the, the stakes for yourself. Be, get better, be better, so that you can expect someone better. Otherwise, you're going to stay at the bottom for the rest yeah. of your life. I have very high expectations of myself, so I'm always pushing myself to the limit to be the best I can be. And as a result of that, everything else around my life, I try to make it the best I can be. I focus on, mm -hmm. I don't eat just junk food because it tastes good. I'm not let myself be dominated by that kind of temporary pleasure and then live the consequence of that, the, the side effects of bad eating habits. I'm very mm -hmm. picky with what I eat. I'm very quite careful with that. Again, I'm 71 years old right now and I have the energy and, and they do everything I did when I was young. And I know that a lot of people my age are not doing what I'm doing. 
They had yeah. a great life. They party a lot. They drank a lot. They did a lot. But there will be consequences. The bill will come for sure. And as I get older now, I see that more and more. You know, people that grew up with me are just yeah. not the same. Because we're going to so, go. We're all going to go one day. We're going to move. And the trick is how long can you enjoy a good life, you know, health, a, a heavy, good quality of life until the very end. That's what I'm at. You know? Yeah. So let me ask you, I've got two little sections I do at the end of every talk. So the first question is, we'll start with the maybe the money slash business one. And this doesn't have to be long, but I just wanted to get, you know, your two to five minute take. If today you had to write one two minute or five minute worth of a chapter of a book on what you've learned about making money and business philosophy, your framework. What would you say, looking back, it can be, you know, all the things you've, you've learned over life. What would you say is the simple framework of creating six financial success in wealth? Um, I think you should find something that you're absolutely passionate about. You have mm -hmm. to find something that you really, really like to do. And then find ways within the stuff that you love to do, find ways to make money with it. In other words, don't get a job just to make money unless you have no choice so that one day you can do the things that you'd like to do. The sooner you can find what you want to do, the sooner you're going to be able to be creative, use your imagination, have ideas, think about it, focus on what you want. And the reason you have to find something that you like to do is because no matter which path you choose, <clears throat> if you want to be successful, it's going to be hard. There will be no's. You can't do it. There's going to be barriers. There's going to be, you know, bumps on the road. There's going to be all kinds of difficulties. Only when you find something that you're really passionate about, you let those problems and those bumps on the road and those difficulties roll over your back and just roll off your back and keep going. You have to find something that you just relentlessly just going to be chasing no matter what. You know, I came here, was teaching class out of my garage and telling people that was going to change the world, 1978. What? Are you crazy? You, are, you have a tourist visa teaching out of a garage, you barely know how to speak English, and you tell them you're going to change the world? Are you crazy? I, mean, I know people thought that of me, but I knew for sure there was not one day, one day that I ever wondered if I was going to be successful or not. I was 100% sure I was going to change the world. And sure enough, when I created the UFC, boom, everything turned upside down. So find something that you're passionate about and create ways that you can make money with that, whatever that is. In order to do something like that, of course, you have to be good and what you want, you know what I'm saying? Find something that you're really good at, that you really know, you know, prepare yourself, work on yourself so that you can be the best you can be at that thing and then fly through with it. There's no, there's no stopping you, you know? People thought that was crazy and this and that. And I'm, of course, you know, there are, there are suggestions, complaints, advice, one year, get in one year, out the other, because I knew exactly what I was going. I was very focused. I knew exactly what I want to do and, and get. And, and uh, I must tell you that I was very happy and successful with what I, Put myself to you know and uh my next goal now is to change people's lives in a very positive way with the gracie diet for example i first came here to teach you now that i created the fc that gave me a platform so that i can stand oh wow the guy created the fc all oh, big deal for me that was just the first step what i really really want to do in my life is change people's life with the gracie diet that's what i meant the jiu-jitsu was just a, a stepping stone for me to now have the my voice has enough echo to get people's attention you know, and now Hardy Gates created the FC. Oh, this is nice. But that's not my mission. I didn't come to America to teach people how to fight. I came to America to teach people how to live better. For example, the Gracie, there's a disease. I'll take one more minute here. There's a disease called irritable bowel syndrome, the most common in, uh, intestinal, uh, gastrointestinal disease in the world, irritable IBS. Mm -hmm. There is no cure for IBS. The doctors will give you antidepressant because they think, you know, stress is a catalyst. They give you muscle relaxant. They give you antibiotics, all kinds of stuff. There's different treatments, and some of them include a diet, a better diet, but they don't know exactly how to do it. I'll tell you what, the Gracie diet will treat IBS, will cure IBS, 100%. So now I'm on a, on a quest doing a research, a scientific research, to prove that Gracie diet does. I already know it does, but I want the, 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 the world and the medical, uh, the medical scene to know that IBS can be cured with the Gracie diet. Watch me win a Nobel Prize of Medicine on that one. I like it. That would be, I, I, I was just in Sweden and Norway. So I hope you're invited there with the uh, Nobel Prize. That would be amazing. Wait and see. Bob Dylan got it with Blowing the Wind. Why do, if I can treat IBS, prove that, it's a, it's be a different story. We'll see. I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest Thank fan. You. Thank you. Okay, last 
uh, the last question that I ask uh, the smartest people that I meet, know and meet in the world, let's imagine you were going on a spaceship with Elon Musk. You decided you wanted to go to Mars, just hypothetically. So you have basically five minutes to turn to your family, your kids, your grandkids, and say to them, here's my advice on life. doesn't have to be just business, but you just look to them and say, here's what I've learned that I want to leave with planet Earth, my kids, my family, my friends, and the population before I go to Mars. Uh, what would your three, four, five minute speech say? Don't limit yourself. Fun, fun is accomplishing the impossible. Don't put, don't set boundaries for yourself. Allow yourself to fly and think and dream as high as you possibly can. Make it happen. Go chase it because there's no stopping you. If you really want something, you can accomplish whatever you want. I am a living example of that. I first came to this country. I was literally panhandling, you know, had no money, sleeping on a newspaper on the sidewalk. And I have got to a point that I'm uh, extremely happy and content with what I have accomplished. And if I can do that, anybody can do that. But you have to really be passionate and dedicated to that. So fun is to accomplish the impossible. That's my motto. And that's what I would tell everyone. So to, for I understand that when you say fun, you're saying reprogram your mind to be disciplined. When it's hard, you go, no, this is fun because the result is going to be right. amazing. Because most people, I read a scientific study that said like 70% of people give up after one time it not working out. Like 80% after two. And almost 90% of the world gives up after three failures because they don't have the discipline. Maybe that's what, is that what you're saying? It's like, no, this is fun. Even though it's failing, we see it as fun because then we'll eventually get it. Edison tried the, the, the electric light, right? Electric lamp, a thousand different ways. You can see that it's a thousand different things, but it's not. He did every possible way and eventually got the light going because he just believed that he was going to find a way to do it. And then, you know, for me, it's the same thing. I mean, fun is to accomplish the impossible. When people say hard, but that can't be done. Huh? I got to do it. That's what I'm at. That's what tickles me to say, you know, wait a minute. It can't be done. It has, you haven't found a way to do it yet, but let's make it happen. So for me, the challenge of going against the grain is what gets me excited, you know? Um, I heard someone say one time that the quality of your life is directly related to the level of uncertainty you can comfortably live with. I've learned to live on the edge. I learned to kind of push myself. It's not quite sure and this and that, but let's make it happen. One of my kids, when he was very young, told me one time, they dad, when, when God pushes you off the cliff, He's what I got. He's either going to catch you on the way down or give you wings and teach you how to fly. So at this stage of my life right now, I see a cliff, I run and jump. <laughs> because I'm, I can't wait to take a chance for the next big project. I, I'm just, you know, I want to do it. I want to make it happen. I want to accomplish the impossible. You know, this whole idea, ridiculous idea of winning the Nobel Prize, it's not my ego that wants the Nobel Prize. It's because if I can get to a point like this, it means that the whole medical community and the people in general, have understood that through a proper eating habit, through a healthy way of eating, you can improve your health. And that, you know, it will be a great recognition and reward to, to kind of recognize Uncle Carlos' work. That's what I'm doing that. It's all through him because he's the one that talks me what I know. And I think this message on, it, on healthy eating is so valuable. It's indeed the most valuable thing you have. You know, if you don't have health, what the heck? You know, you got nothing. Health is the first law. You can have all the money in the world. You know that you know a lot of people that are very wealthy they spend their whole life making a lot of money and on the end they spend all their money trying to recoup their health their health recoup their health it doesn't work you have to think about health first do whatever you have to do but don't overlook your health i saw i saw a, a video the other day the beginning of it bill gates you know the mind of bill gates or something like that and uh i said well of course the guy is a genius a very smart guy does everything he did not that i approve of everything but there's a whole bunch of stuff that he does is great and then he goes, he takes his own little moments away to do some focusing on thinking. And he opens the fridge and there's nothing but soft drink in there. Coca-Cola. He said, what? What kind of genius is that? You know what I'm saying? Killing himself with that kind of stuff. I mean, what is it? What's going on? You know? So, you know, I said, I don't, thank you very much. I've seen enough. <laughs> so, it's, of course, he's got an amazing brain. But to have that kind of capability and be drinking that kind of stuff is like, please give me a break. You know what I'm saying? So I gotta stay here. I'm gonna drink a coconut in a minute. 
fresh coconut. I go to the produce market once a week here in downtown LA, stack my house with fruits and there are three refrigerators in my house because my health is the most important thing, period. Hands down, there's nothing like it. I don't mind not having the millions and the billions, but I enjoy every single minute of my life, no doubt. I mean, just for me, it's priceless. That's what I'm at. No that price. was amazing. In, invite me. I'd like to come to the Nobel Prize. I've never been to the <laughs> ceremony. All right. I'll take you up on that then. You'll see. Well, thank, thank you so much for being here. This was amazing. I want to have you on again. For everybody listening, make sure you go. I, you can get the – I also have the Gracie Diet. I think I have it on – well, I have the book, but I also have it because I like to do this for notes. I'm going to see if it's on this phone. But you can get it in uh, iBooks too, which is really good because I like to keep – yeah, right here. I have it on my phone, Gracie Diet. So the reason I like – and I recommend those of you listening to get on the iPhone is when you see a good point in the book. Sometimes when I have physical books, I lose the book or you move or something. But what I like about iBooks here, you can see I have highlights. So I have my notes there. I don't know if you can see. So yeah, I have a note. I have a note. Here's a great note on page 43. Weight control is a matter of defending yourself in a fight against a ruthless, op ruthless opponent who will use every trick in the book to harm you processed food. So that's just a great point from the book. Another good quote that I have here. I love this one. A good rule of thumb is to adhere to is to stop eating when you're 80% full. And then just remember, you'll be eating again in about four and a half hours because part of your diet is like resting, letting your intestines and your digestive system rest for about, is it about four and a half hours? Correct. Four and a half to five hours. Yes. Oh, it's well, that's no good. snacking in between meals. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Three meals a day. Do not mix starches. When you eat bread, you should not eat potato. Hamburger and french fries is not a good combination. You do either bread or potato or rice or quinoa or beans. One starch per meal, all the vegetables you want. Uh, do not eat cooked food that is prepared with oil or fat and butter. And then follow with sweets with a dessert. Okay. So, hmm. And then space your meals four and a half hours apart. Piece of cake. The book will tell you everything is on Amazon. So, yes, Amazon, iBooks, tylopez.com slash Gracie podcast. I'll have the show notes. Uh, we'll have the video, the audio. You can forward it to your friends. You can get the links. You'll have a link to Grandmaster Horion's website. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure talking to you again, and then all the best. Okay, take care. Yeah.